we are holistic beings. And so if you're only working on financial and you're ignoring the other ones, those are the ones that will sabotage you because it'll be like, well, I emotionally wasn't taking care of myself. And also maybe you have a breakdown. Right. So you start, you start that, losing yourself. Yes. Yeah. You start losing who Absolutely. you are. Uh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash that like button and click subscribe. For those of you listening on a podcast platform, be sure to subscribe on whatever platform that is and leave us a rating if you can. The more likes, ratings, and subscriptions that we get, the more we can spread the message and grow our community. So we also have a free Facebook group. It's called The Average Joe Finances Network. Check us out, join the group, join the community, ask questions, and become a part of the team. All of our other social media accounts are listed in our flow page and we have them in the video or podcast description below. Hey, how's it going, everybody? So today's guest is Robert Raymond Riappel, and he's an international best-selling author, app designer, entrepreneur, and trainer who spent the last 18 plus years traveling around the world and sharing his passion. He's also shared the stage with and trained many of the top trainers and thought leaders of the world today. With his high energy and heartfelt style, Robert draws on his journey from humble beginnings to financial freedom at the age of 32 to inspire individuals into tapping into their own greatness. Realizing that he is not the only person that struggles, Robert's quote clues open individuals up to possibilities that lie within them, and that is why he is a highly sought after presenter. Uh, Robert, I am absolutely thrilled to have you on the show. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, Mike, I'm so happy to be here. And and even just our short conversation before recording, I, I just feel a great connection and and just loving that I have this opportunity. Absolutely. And now, you know, I normally wear like an average Joe finances shirt or anything like that. But uh, today I, I got a really bad sunburn when I was out hiking the other day. It's pretty bad. I've got my lighting set up and I'm wearing my hat the way I am so that you can't see the the raccoon lines on my face. Um, but I'm really badly burnt and I needed something comfortable that wasn't going to like really press up on me. And I decided to go with my blue collared shirt. And what do you know? We're, we're kind of matching a little bit, <laughs> but, um, that was the start of our conversation, uh, off, off recording. But, um, anyway, I want to talk a little bit more in detail about your story. And so I shared a little bit about your background. Uh, I'm really excited to hear, you know, Where's where's Robert start? Like, what got you, you know, to where you are today? Well, you know, I, I grew up in a family. I'm the youngest of four, and in my family, uh, very, let's just say, my parents we moved around a lot because just to supply and support the family, they had to work from job to job to job. So I never spent more than six months in any school up until I was in the grade four, and so to me that was normal. And also, we moved from I live in Canada. We moved from British Columbia where I was born to Alberta. And that was the first place where we actually started to settle down, even though we were still moving around in the same city, we were you know, starting to get some normalcy. And I was taught as a child, when it comes to work, you work hard and you stay loyal. And I started working, you know, Mike, it's interesting. One of my first jobs at 11 years old, I spent the summer babysitting three kids, eight hours a day, five days a week, for people that lived in our little condo complex. And that 11? was one of my first jobs at 11. And one was an infant. I'm changing diapers. I'm making lunch. I'm making dinner. But that wow. was kind of normal back then for us, right? And I, I knew I wanted to have my own income. And in my family, I've got two older brothers. And it's interesting, because of the conversation we've had, this is a kind of an insight I don't normally talk about when I'm, when I'm sharing my story. But my oldest brother, he ended up... Um, getting his girlfriend pregnant at 18. So he decided to join the Navy as an income and get married. Then my other brother, he ended up getting his girlfriend pregnant at 17. And so he joined the armed forces <laughs> for security and they got married. And so the running joke in our family is, well, Robert, does that mean at 16, that's what you're going to do? 
And I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> even though I was on track to become an officer in the Navy, you know, as I'm sharing with you off um, recording, I was, you, you were trending lucky. in the right direction, but, <laughs> but steered away. I did. I did. And it was because I got the opportunity to spend three months in the Navy at the age of 16 on a tour of duty that taught me, no, that's not the life I want. Um, because if I wanted a relationship, I wanted to be home. I, I absolutely wanted to be home. And so I went into the workforce itself. And by the time I was 21, though, I'd worked for three different companies. And my mind's going, if I'm working hard, I'm staying loyal. Why do all these companies keep laying me off? And I look back now, Mike, and I go, thank goodness I learned this at that age because I realized if I wanted any kind of success in my life, I had to take control of it. And where I live, when oil prices are good, everything's boom, lots of work. But when oil prices are low, then there's no work. And so here I am. I've just been laid off from a factory because they're closing. I'm newly married, and I'm going, what am I going to do? And I knew I, because of my upbringing, I was going to do something to support my family. It doesn't matter. I don't care if I'm cleaning toilets, whatever it is. I'll do whatever it takes, whether I like it or not. And I ended up starting to deliver pizzas for a little company called Domino's Pizza. And I started loving it and started making more money than I was making in my real jobs. Because I was always having fun, getting paid to drive around, have fun and meet people, you know, was better than that. And I was able to go from that to being a manager. My wife became my assistant manager because what do you do? You work hard, seven days a week, open the clothes. So to spend time together, we were working full time. And all of a sudden, my franchisee, a year and a half in, I'm now qualified to be a franchisee. Now, qualified means once you've successfully managed a store for a year, meeting all these um, criteria, you're qualified to be a franchisee. It doesn't mean you can be because you also have to have some money to do that. But we were qualified when my franchisee announced that I'm selling the stores. I'm done with Domino's. I'm frustrated. And we knew that if a new owner came in, the first people gone are the managers. And so out of necessity, we made the decision, we're going to buy the store we're working in. And of course, everybody's wow. going like, how are you going to do that? You have no money. And we're like, we don't know, but we're going to make it work. And we made a lot of trial and a lot of error, but we learned. And over the next four months, we figured out what to say, how to say it, that we actually ended up getting 100% financing for both the stores he had for sale. And we became franchisees. And of course, at that point, it's like, we're 23 and we're like, oh, we're franchisees. We've got made. Yeah. We knew how to manage a store, Mike, but we didn't know how to run a business. Right. And big difference right there. And so by the time we were franchisees for eight years, we we're actually over $150,000 in debt and going down quickly. And that's when we were actually introduced to personal development. Out of necessity, we ended up getting tickets to an evening. And the only reason we showed up the evening is because each ticket was worth $39. And thank goodness my mind would not let me waste that ticket price. Even though the tickets were given to us at no cost, we walked in. Three hours later, we're just blown away. We're finding ourselves running to the back, paying $600 to go to a weekend, $600 that we can't afford, but something felt right. That weekend was three months later in, in uh, March, or sorry, June of 2001. We walked in $150,000 in debt, stressed out beyond belief. We learned that weekend how we handled money and why we did, what was going on, how to manage it, why were we struggling? And with a new mindset we, and new tools and new actions to take, we walked out, put them into um, place, and we ended up retiring, going from the $150,000 in debt to retiring, actually completely financially free, nine months later when we were 32. Wow. That's that's phenomenal. How, how did you go from $150,000 in debt to retiring nine months later? Well, so I, I'm going to have some fun with you here if you're ready to have some fun, Mike. Because let me ask I'm you I'm always question. ready to have some fun. I knew that. That's why I knew I could do this. Is <laughs> when I said we went from $150,000 in debt to completely retiring financially three nine months later. What did your mind say to you besides wow? What did you think? Did you think that that meant we did well? We were wealthy. We were millionaires. Where did your mind kind of go? So for for me, because I I kind of think differently when it comes to finances. I I think you changed your mindset on what your debt actually was. So like what. What was your debt? What was the hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt? Was that, you know, debt that was in the real estate of the business, um, stuff that you can, you know, leverage 
uh, for for the future, or you know, was it like actual, you know, your your business is bleeding? So it it, it makes it makes a difference as to what kind of debt that was. Wow, I've never actually had someone go that in depth. I like where your mind's going, and it was a combination of all. Okay. And what most people think though is they think, wow, you went from one hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt completely got rid of it. And now you're millionaires in nine months. And I want to let people right away know that is absolutely not the truth. There's a definition that we had learned in the weekend of what financial freedom is. Financial freedom is simply nothing more than when passive income, money working instead of you and you being a real estate investor in that, you understand passive income. When your passive income is actually greater than your expenses, you are now financially free. Why? Because if you don't work, you still have enough money coming in to pay those day-to-day debt um, expenses. So in nine months, we ended up, because we learned that we had way too many expenses. We, we had all the toys. One of the reasons we were in debt, we liked our instant gratification. One of our stores was in a resort community, so we had a boat. Now, boating season was our busy season, so the boat sat in our driveway. And we never got to use it, but we had all the expenses. <laughs> and so we took a hard look and we really reduced our expenses, looking at what don't we need right now. And then we started learning about passive income. So it only took nine months before the two surpassed. So I want people to understand, because I don't want them to think I'm any different or any better than anybody else. I'm I'm the same. Look, if you're watching this video, you see I'm aerodynamic. If you're listening, I'm going to tell you, I'm aerodynamic. I, I, so there's things that I don't have. Right? He's, what, he's talking about his hair, people, for those of you listening. That's right. That's right. Someone says, you're bald. And I'm like, no, I'm aerodynamic. I just walk 20% faster than other people. I, I like it. I like it. So once once I actually shave my head, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that line. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And the thing, the reason I wanted to understand that, and the reason I take a little time explaining it is because my wife and I were we didn't get rid of all of our debt, but we had enough passive income to service that debt. We had got rid of a lot, but we still had debt. But what we gained was the fact that we went from now. 40, 50, 60, 70 or more hours a week having to work in our business to earn a living. All that time was now freed up because now we didn't have to work. And all of a sudden we had time freedom. And I, I, because I love to teach people and utilize universal principles, there's a saying that says what you focus on expands. So when all of a sudden we went from stressed out and all this time being spent working in our stores, we now have all that time free. We said, what are we going to use with that time for? And one, we dove in to learn. We started learning from as many people as we could because we realized if a little bit of education gave us those results that we just got, what would more do? But then we also committed, we were gonna take 10 hours a week, 10 hours a week to focus on creating wealth. And all of a sudden now, when we took that 10 hours a week and our sole focus in that 10 hours each week was creating wealth, it's amazing how quickly wealth comes. And so that's kind of how I, kind of got to where I am because at the same time, I've also realized my passion was to teach others because I I realized if I could even help one person, one person do what my wife and I had done, go from stress to success in finances, it'd make it all worthwhile. And that's when I became a trainer. Yeah. No, I, I love that's That's amazing because that's exactly what I started this podcast for is to have, you know, to be able to share stories like this, you know, where to show somebody that you can you can be at this point where you feel like you're you're constantly digging out of the hole and you're constantly just trying to get up out of debt and you feel like there's no way just to but you have to just work harder and harder and harder and grind harder when there are other ways. Yes, it still takes work to get that passive income to where you need it to be, but it doesn't have to be as stressful as you think it has to, right? And being able to share a story like this is just absolutely awesome because, you know, there was a couple things that happened for you uh, after that training that I'm, that I'm seeing and the stuff that I'm taking down in my notes here is you had a complete mindset shift, right? You started looking at your situation a hundred percent differently. You started looking at your debt differently. You started looking at, Hey, okay, now the goal is how do I get my passive income to service the debt that we already have? Right. Exactly. So you already know what your monthly payments are. So your passive income needs to match that or exceed it. And then you're good. Now you're working for yourself after that. At that point, you're you're essentially, like you said, financially independent. And now everything you do is for your own gain after that. So now you guys are doing things to benefit yourselves, taking that 10 hours a week 
to focus on wealth building, you know, that's what your focus is. You don't have to worry about the bills or anything like that. It's covered. Exactly. Right. So that's, exactly. that's, that's amazing. Um, yeah, Robert, that's, that's, that's awesome. So I wanted to ask you, so there's, there's something I know that you talk about called the four currencies of life. Mm-hmm. So could you explain what that is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The first currency is the one everybody thinks of money. And what people right. don't realize when you talk about money, there too much money is something called affluenza and affluenza is, you know, you're having affluenza when you start doing crazy things with your money. So as an example, think of the prince or whoever on the other side of the world that he decided to spend a billion dollars to buy an A380 jetliner for his party plane. Then he spent another hundred million renovating the two deck stories of it to make it the ultimate plane for party. That's affluenza. You start doing crazy stuff when you have too much money. Too little money is called poverty. And I don't know about your listeners and your viewers, but to me, financial stress has got to be the worst stress I've ever gone through. When you're afraid to pick up the phone because it's a debt collector, you're like, it's just, it's stressful. And so what I've found over the years, Mike, working with a lot of very successful people is I've noticed one of the reasons people don't go for wealth themselves is because they think wealth changes people. And if I have too much money, it's going to change me. And what I want people to understand is, first of all, money doesn't change you. You change money. Money just makes you more of who you already are. So if you're a kind, caring person, you're going to become more kind, caring, help more people. If you're a jerk, you're going to become a bigger jerk, plain and simple. But I've noticed that there's a comfort zone of where the ultimate number is for you. So as an example for me, I don't need to have millions and tens of millions of dollars. If I know that I've got my software, I've got a great finances working, and I'm still bringing in a nice cash flow, 200, 300, 400,000 a year, I'm happy. I don't need to kill myself, busting my butt, trying to make millions. But some people, they want to make millions. That's what drives them. And for them, that's okay. And so once I understood where my zone was, uh, if I was going over that, I started doing stupid things with money. So I was in affluenza. Or if I was lower, I was stressed out. Also, when I realized where that nice comfort flow was, that made my life so much easier because now I could plan to say this year, I'm going to do this and this to earn an income. My investments, I'm looking to do this. And I'm constantly watching and tracking to keep in that zone. It allows me and my wife to have an amazing life, if that makes sense. Okay. So that's Absolutely. the first currency. That's the first currency. Second currency is called the one currency everybody has the exact same amount of time. The currency of time. Too much time on your hand creates boredom. Too little time is stress. And how many people, it, it kind of blew me away, you know, March 10th, 2020, I land back in Canada from doing a three-day training in India. And March 11th, I got put into lockdown. All my live events around the world got canceled. My life changed. And so now I went from traveling around the world to being at home all the time. And it was like, I got busy. Because two very important words I want you to um, audience to understand that whenever they get into a position and not sure what to do, ask these two words, what's next? I had to go through a whole reinvention because all my trains have been live on stage in front of people. And so I was blown away when I started hearing people going, I'm bored. I'm bored at home. And I'm like, I'm busier at home than when I'm traveling around the world. So the currency of time is, again, look for that balance that allows you to really have what do you want to do? Uh, a lot of people say, well, Robert, I'm so busy, I can't get success. Yeah, but there's a difference between busy and productive. Right. Yes. Right. And when you get productive, you'll be amazed at how much time you can free up for family, friends, yourself. That's a big one. Giving yourself time. And so that's something I talk about also in what I call my four phases of life. But taking care of yourself, you can't give what you don't have. So if you haven't taken care of yourself, how can you fully take care of other people? So that's the second currency. The third currency is called fame. And it's amazing how many people, especially with social media, what they will do to try and get fame. And I loved listening to an interview that was done with Jennifer Lopez one time, because, you know, too much fame can just it, it can ruin lives. We've seen that happen again and again. And yeah, so and you, said, you're, you have no privacy. Exactly. And so someone said, well, you know, Jennifer, you're so successful. How do you but you're also a great mother, great family person. How do you keep the two separate? And she said, simple, when I'm on stage or I'm doing a movie or I'm singing, I'm jailed. 
But when I'm at home with my family, I'm Jennifer Lopez. And that simple little distinction in her mind, I, as soon as I heard that, I went, wow. So when I'm on stage in front of thousands of people, I'm Robert Raymond Real. But the moment I'm home, I'm just Robert or Rob. And my wife and I have a little running joke that when I get home from being around the world and I've had you know, staff taking care of every need I have, I get home, she goes, honey, no more assistance. Go take out the garbage. And that keeps me grounded because if I let the fame get to my head, that's where ego will do some pretty interesting things. So when it comes to fame, it's about finding your balance. What is it? You know, if you want to be known, then be known, but give yourself time to be you in your day to day life, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, being able to remain humble. Yeah. Yeah. The fourth currency is the one I spend my most that is my main focus now, which is the currency of experience is experience. Are you truly experiencing your life? You know, someone, I'm a big believer in vision boards. I don't, do you believe in vision boards, Mike? Oh, yes. We've got one up okay. down in my living room. <laughs> Perfect. And and do you, is there a specific car you have on that vision board, as an example, that you would love to have? Uh, well, I, I already got that car. Yes, it, it was nice. on there. Nice. Okay. And so one of the reasons I use the car as an example is because a coach taught me this lesson when he was telling me about one of his students. Is his student had this um, picture on his vision board of a gorgeous Lamborghini. Absolutely stunning. That's what his ultimate car. That's what he wanted. And so my friend asked him, he said, well, you know, why do you want a Lamborghini? He goes, oh my God, they're gorgeous cars. Blah, blah, blah. And let's rob all these reasons. He says, have you ever rode in one? Have you ever driven one? Well, no. He says, so here's what I want you to do for work. Home. Before our next call, I want you to go down to a dealership, test drive one, rent one. I don't care. But I want you to go to experience it and see if the experience matches what you think it will be. On the next call, he said to him, he said, so how's it going with the Lamborghini? He goes, yeah, don't want one. He said, what? He said, I'm six foot three. You know how hard it was getting in and out of that? <laughs> he said, I, I wouldn't be able to do that very well. He said, exactly. So when it comes to experience, I'm all about experiencing life on a day-to-day basis. One of the, probably the greatest gifts that has come from this time in our world with um, the coronavirus is I've been able to experience greater connections with people than I have in years. Because now it's like, you know what, I want to, I'm not going to be sitting and going, I'm busy, busy, busy. And well, think of it like this, Mike, have you ever talked to someone where they were there physically, but you know, mo- mo- uh, mentally and emotionally, they're somewhere else. Oh yeah. All the time. People yeah. are zoning out. And yeah. so now my goal is to experience being there present with everybody I talk to. And just because it, when you go for the currency of experience, that's, what's going to make your life memorable. Uh, I, one of my practices I love to do is every morning I do a, a success and gratitude journal. And it used to just be a success journal, five successes from the day before, but then it started to morph into also things I was grateful for. And if someone's um, name came up to me, like all of a sudden I'm like, and you normally they come to mind because you remember an experience with them. And so what I started doing is instead of just writing their name down, which I do in my journal, I actually now will reach out to them and just, I used to start typing a message on Messenger or whatever, but then I went, I want to leave them a voice message. And I would just out of the blue say, hey, I was doing my gratitude journal today, and you came to mind because of this time. I just wanted to let you know how grateful I am that you are in my life. Now, when I do this, I do it with no attachment that they get back to me, that they ever even hear it. It's about me expressing that experience of gratitude. So I put that out more to the universe. And some people I never hear back from, and that's totally okay. But it's also amazing how many people, maybe I haven't talked to in years, but because I had left them a message, also we reconnect and we re-experience and we renew our friendship. It's, it's pretty, I, I find, I love it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's amazing because you're, you know, you're, you're showing that you're not only, um, you know, investing in your own personal finances and everything else that you're doing to get financially free, but you're investing in yourself spiritually you're investing in your friends and your family around you. And this is all part of that being, you know, doing that daily gratitude. So that, you know, this for me, it's an accountability thing. Uh, you are reminding me that I need to get better at journaling because I was doing it every night before I went to bed and every morning when I, when I uh, would wake up. Um, and I have not been as, uh, I guess, uh, adamant about it. So I'm going to, uh, make that a, a mission for myself to start doing that more. 
Um, okay, cool. So thank you for reminding yeah. me. Let's take a brief moment to hear from our show sponsors. What's going on, everybody? So today I want to talk to you about the podcast editing service that we use for the Average Joe Finances podcast. That is editpods.com. And what I really like about them is it's a subscription-based service, so the prices are fantastic. And not only do they do the podcast episodes for us, but they also make us videos, audiograms, social media caption videos. They do our show notes, thumbnails. It's just fantastic products. Go check them out at editpods.com. What's going on, Average Joes? We know that managing one account or your entire family's portfolio can be stressful and time consuming. From building and maintaining spreadsheets, calculating how many new shares and units you need to purchase with your contributions, finding the time to log into your brokerage and make those trades, and annually rebalancing each account. Well, my friends over at Passive came up with a tool that can help you manage all of this in a fraction of time without spreadsheets and manual calculations. Passive is a portfolio management tool that makes it easier for DIY investors to maintain a balanced portfolio and build a passive investment strategy at their online broker. It eliminates the need to use spreadsheets, saves you from having to log into your broker to place trades, and helps you stick to your portfolio's target allocation. Elite users can save even more time by using the one-click trades feature and having Passive execute the required trades on your behalf. All of this can be done from the Passive dashboard for all of your accounts. No more logging in to multiple brokerage accounts. Passive is not a robo-advisor. It won't tell you what you should invest in, so you'll need to decide that for yourself, either through self-education or alongside a financial advisor. To learn more about Passive or to sign up, check out our link below, www.averagejoefinances.com slash passive. That's P-A-S-S-I-V with no E. Again, P-A-S-S-I-V with no E. Check them out. Let's get back to today's episode. Because I know you like to have fun, can I take you on a little journey with that? Let's go on a journey. Perfect. Do you believe that words have power? Absolutely. So you, I don't know if you realize it, but you just put a lot of pressure on yourself by using one word. I need to do this. Also, that word need comes with such a negative energy with it that it now brings resentment or um, pressure, overwhelm. So one little adjustment I would I would say to maybe make is instead of I need to do this, is I choose to do it. Because okay. the word yeah, I like, I like that. choose I like that. gives you so much more empowerment. So that's just a little, little thought. <laughs> need versus choose. I'm writing yeah. this down. Yeah, because a lot of no, people that's, don't That's realize. right. I did. I did. I, I did just put a lot of pressure on myself because now it's like my focus after I get off this interview now is, hey, let me go blow the dust off this journal, you know, and uh, – you know, make sure I have it where I need to. Actually, I, I have it on my nightstand. It's just sitting there. So, but now I'm, you know, I'm, I am putting pressure on myself to make sure I crack that thing open every night. So yeah, no, it, it needs to be a choice. Not a, not that I'm forcing myself to do it. Exactly. For sure. And because what you, you mentioned it earlier is wealth. And I love that you do the average Joe finance because we, people put so much pressure on themselves around money. And then they wonder that if they get it going, why do they sabotage themselves? And what you said, it brought it to light. You, it, it's working on the mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, and financial. We are holistic beings. And so if you're only working on financial and you're ignoring the other ones, those are the ones that will sabotage you. Because it'll be like, well, I emotionally wasn't taking care of myself. And also maybe you have a breakdown. Right. So you start, you start that, losing yourself. Yes. Yeah. You start losing who Absolutely. you are. Uh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Yeah. Awesome. You had mentioned something earlier. Uh, so we were just talking about the four currency, four currencies in life. And you said that there's another thing you talk about called the four phases of life. So I'm, I'm having a feeling that this all ties in together. Um, and so I'd like to talk about that a little bit. What, what are the four phases of life that, that people go through? Uh, and it's something that you can go through all four in a day. Sometimes it takes longer. It could be a month before you go through all four. I, okay. use, I love acronyms and I use the acronym OPEN. And I will tell okay. you, I'm not going to take credit for this. Uh, uh, an amazing friend of mine, he, I, I nicknamed him the quantum monk because not only was he actually a monk for eight years, over 15,000 hours of meditation, but then he also studies quantum physics. So he can tell you all about spirituality and then back it up with the science behind it. He, wow. He's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. And he, he he's like a real life Doctor Strange. Yeah. Did you, you ever see that Doctor. movie? I did. When Love they it. go into the and stuff like that's that's what immediately came and popped into my head when you say that, like, oh, he, he's the yeah, ancient that, one. That's it. And and it, it's it's crazy, you know, when you when you look at 
because there's I, I admire so many people that have talents in that that I don't have. And instead of being jealous of them or envious, I, I just I'm, I admire. I marvel in, in how they can do what they do. It's, you know, it's amazing. And so he had created through his study something called the chaos modules, but it wasn't his passion. He had just come across it. It was powerful. And I said to him, I said, great. I said, this needs to get out to the world. Can I, I want to put it in my upcoming book. And he said, absolutely, Robert, use it. And so I spent hours interviewing him, going in deep. I want to make sure I was on the right path and I, I was going to do it justice. And so through all of our interviews and I was putting it into my own words and I used the acronym open, he's just like, you got this deeper than I have. And he was amazed and it just more. So the O in open stands for observation phase. And so you've heard the saying, Mike, that we're human beings, not human doings. Well, in the observation phase, you're actually a human creating. This is a time when you're in this phase, you meditate, you dream. What is it I truly want in my life? This is where vision boards come into place. You create a vision board. You don't let your mind go, well, how am I going to do it? You just create. In this space, it's about being centered, being present, creating. And then from there, the P phase, it stands for pamper. And what's interesting about the pamper phase is probably, especially entrepreneurs, people that self-sabotage a lot, the reason is they forget to do this. And what the pamper phase is, is exactly what it sounds like. This is you taking care of you. This is where maybe when you go into the pamper phase, you go on a vacation. Or if you can't, then you plan a vacation. Or you go and get your nails, your hair done, if you have them. You go get a massage. (laughs) Maybe during the pamper phase, this is where you read a book. If you love reading, take 20 minutes and read. Um, People would always say, okay, Robert, why is it you fly overseas to do all your trainings where you're on a plane 10, 12, 16, or 18 hours? And I'm like, well, I love to train all over the world, but one of the main reasons is that's for me. See, the moment I'm on a plane, I don't connect to Wi-Fi if it's available. That's my time. I read. I love movies. I'm loving all, you know, <laughs> I see the Star Wars in your background. I love movies. So I read, I watch movies, I enjoy good food, and I drink good wine. That's how I take care of me because I know the moment I land, for three to five days, the next three to five days, I'm on stage up to 12 hours or more a day being of service to 100 to 6,000 students at a time. And so if I don't take care of me, how can I take care of them, if that makes sense? Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's being able to take care of yourself, like even on like a long plane ride like that, like, you know, it's that's not even something that I really think about too much because for me, I get on the plane and I'm focused on the destination and what what's going on when I'm going to get there and, you know, and things like that. So you know, you being able to disconnect and have yourself like a little me time uh, is is super important. I realize as you're explaining this pamper phase that it, it is it is definitely something that entrepreneurs like that they, they self sabotage a bit. I, I, I do it myself. Um, I'm kind of like you know you're helping open my eyes here a little bit that a lot of times you know because I'm still active duty in the Navy, but I, I, I do you know, this podcast on the side, I'm also a, uh, a realtor associate, a uh, realtor associate and, and an investor. And I, I find that a lot of times I, I do get too involved and I, I forget other things going on around me. I don't take care of, you know, the, the me time. Right. So, uh, yeah, this, this is important. This is, a. Uh, I have a feeling that the next two are going to be just as important. So I'm, I'm ready to, to get there. And they do. They all tie together because the E stands for energy phase. This is the time when it's time to get right. stuff done. You know, when I'm in energy phase, I can put in an 18, 20 hour day. A, have the energy to do it because I've taken care of myself, but B, not feel guilty. Because in the pamper phase, this is also when you make sure you have time with family. You make sure you have time for things that are important to nurture so that when you're energy time, you can get down and get the work done. Um, because I have students all different time zones. It's not uncommon on an energy phase day for me to go from as early as 5 or 6 a.m. all the way to 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. And it's okay because I've taken care of me. So the energy phase, that's when you do documents, interviews, you know, you get the work done. That's energy, 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 energy. That's the energy phase. And then the fourth phase. Now, so even though I use the word open as an acronym, the N is not the first letter of the word. I had to get creative on this one Mm -hmm. because the word is un- Clutter, unclutter. And the unclutter phase, another name for that is chaos. 
And then you'll see it like this, Mike. If you ever notice that, things can be going really, really well. And all of a sudden, it's like this brick wall gets thrown up in front of you. And your life gets a huge detour that happens. Has that ever happened in your life? It's happened quite often, actually. Well, see, because I'm watching I, I, you rigorously I, take notes. That's why I'm having yeah. fun with you. Because I knew it would take you. I know. I, yeah, I do. I, I'm, well, here, here's the thing. I, I, this This little book right here is like every interview I've done – um, I take notes from every guest and it's like my little black book of knowledge. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I think it's super important to, to take notes because yeah, I, sure. I, I'll, I'll transcribe the episode. I'll have everything that was said, but at the same time, like this, this is for me, this is my yes. personal notes. And, uh, I am probably taking more notes with the stuff you're talking about than I have with anybody else. Cause I've got two pages already. Well, see, because that's I'm, because I'm, taking, I'm taking it personal because a lot of this, um, I identify with. So that's th- this interview is I'm probably going to get more out of it than my listeners. Well, I, mean, I don't know. We'll see. But I, I'm getting a lot out of this and I'm, I'm truly appreciative for sure. Well, and that's why I'm loving having fun with you, because right now you're actually <laughs> in a bit of a pamper phase because you know how important those notes are to allow you to really be who you are. So that's why I'm having fun with it, which is cool. Awesome. So in the end club <laughs> phase. This is what happens for most people is chaos enters their life mm. and they get frustrated and they resist chaos. And so a little bit of a mind um, set shift I want to do with your audience is understand that you want to embrace chaos. And why you want to embrace chaos is because as human beings, we were meant to evolve. And chaos is what comes into our life to gently help us evolve. But if we're not embracing it, it'll come in and it'll really make us evolve because we end up resisting. Now, the reason I call it the uncluttered phase is because you can absolutely volunteer for chaos. And what that means is, is you look and you unclutter something. Maybe I walk in my office and I go, you know what? Today, I'm going to organize my office. I'm going to unclutter it because I've just let it get junky. Or you open the refrigerator and you go, wow, there's probably, yep, some food in here that probably could be cleaned out. So you unclutter the fridge. And what that does is to the universe is if you're volunteering to unclutter things, it doesn't have to give you the lesson as hard. And so when it, when we talk about the uncluttered phase, this is the one where, because it is chaos, you've got to really, it takes courage. You've got to be willing to courageously volunteer. So in the chaos or uncluttered phase, this is time to destroy something. Now, here's what I mean by that. Maybe there's a business or personal relationship that just isn't working anymore, that a person's been hanging on to too long. In this phase, it's time to let that um, relationship go. In this phase, maybe um, you've wanted a new car, but you, because you're tired of the clunker and the expenses of maintaining your old car. Well, until you let go of the old car, you're not going to get the new car. So you've got to really be, and, and here's the way I love how my friend said it, instead of being willing to um, live life, courageously allow life to live you. Because if you think about it, everything that goes on in your life there's that saying that said everything happens for a reason. And you've probably heard that saying before, like a lot of your audience, but very few of them have actually heard the whole statement because it's not just everything happens for a reason. The statement is everything happens for a reason. And that reason is there to serve me. And if you look at it wow. like that, now you get curious. Now the curiosity comes in of, so why did that happen? And I'll, I'll use the example, um, Mike, of in 2004 was the first time I did a training on my own. I wasn't co-training with my mentor. I I didn't have his assistance. I did my own first training, three days, 1,200 students in Los Angeles. And from that moment to mid-2008, I ended up doing over 200 multi-day trainings around North America, plus then into Asia. And I got burnt out. I was overliving my passion, absolutely overliving it. And I knew I had to take a year off. Now, when I decided to take a year off, because I was burnt out, I ended up taking over three and a half years. And one of the reasons was, A, I went from overliving my passion, which was bad, to B, not living it at all, which is just as bad. Some of the old negative, non-supportive habits started coming back in my life. But also when I was overliving and not taking care of me, while I was on the stage, I had actually not taken care of my body and I herniated a disc. And in that time off, I went through two back surgeries. So I needed the recuperating time. And it's interesting how the universe, God, whatever higher power a person wants to go by, if you ever notice, you're always getting sent lessons. Would you agree with that, Mike, that you're always getting lessons sent to you? Oh, yes. Yeah. And if you don't listen to the lesson and you don't utilize it, 
what normally happens. Not good things, that's for sure. Yeah, you get it again more intensely. And see, I put out the intention. You're going to get it until you learn it. That's right. I put out the intention, I'm taking one year off. So one year, all of a sudden turned into a year and a half. The universe is sending me messages. Robert, you said you're going to train again. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wasn't listening. It turned up the energy. And it was two years into my break when the universe sent me a message I couldn't ignore. I, My mother-in-law, who at the time lived across the street from us, she'd asked me to help her out August 10th, 2010. I walked across the street, beautiful sunny day. There was a, a playground across the street from my house. There's about 30 kids playing. I walk up, help her out with the TV. I'm walking back. And just before I cross the street to my driveway, a couple comes walking out with a bull mast of dog. And I love animals. I love animals. So I'm standing on the sidewalk. They're standing in front of my driveway. And I said, uh, is she friendly? And they're like, no, no, she's not. We just rescued her. We're rehabilitating. So I stayed where I was. They stayed where they were. And we talked for a while. And eventually I knelt down and they slowly brought her over. I let her smell my hand. I petted her head, petted her neck. No problem. But the moment I went to stand up, she lunged for my throat. And it happened so fast, I didn't know it hit me. And because from the standing motion, I had dropped my head down. Instead of getting my throat, she got my chin. And she now proceeded to try and drag me to the ground. I'm instantly in shock. And the only thing in my head is if she gets me to the ground, I'm dead. So I stood up and she's now hanging off my jaw. And the guy actually had to physically pry her jaws off of me. And then it was taking him and his wife, both, both of them on the leash to hold her back because she's lunging back at me. Now there's blood all over the place. And my only thought is there's 30 children behind me. I said, I live right there. Get her out of here. So they drag the dog up the street and I'm walking to my house and there's blood dripping all over. And I'm just about to go in the door. And my mind goes, if I get blood in the house, my wife's going to kill me. Oh, no. it's, it's crazy what goes through your head right? when you're in shock, right? I open the door. I think I say it calmly. I'm like, Roxanne? <laughs> of course, it was so calm. She came running. She sees the blood. She's like, what's going on? And I, I got attacked by a dog. And so she gets a towel, stuffs it to my chin. And now I'm safe. That fight or flight. I'm safe. All of a sudden, I start to feel lightheaded. I'm about to pass out. My wife sees me starting to wobble. She knows if I drop, there's no way she's getting me to the hospital. So she goes into what we call her warrior mode. She sees me starting to wobble. And she looks at me. She goes, don't you faint. Get to that car. And I'm like, let's do her. <laughs> and I get up to the car. <laughs> And now it took. She, she re-enabled your fight or flight, right? Oh, she. Re oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look, Mike. In 32 years of marriage, I've learned the two most important words in a relationship. Yes, dear. <laughs> most important words. <laughs> she gets me to the hospital, and if you know dog bites, they don't like to um, close up any dog wounds. They want any bacteria to be able to flush out. So there's three puncture wounds, basically where my goatee is, but on my chin, the dog had ripped through my chin. And so it took nine stitches to close that up. Now, in that moment, I had a choice. Coming back to that word choose, you and I were talking about earlier. See, I could have looked at the situation and went, why the did that happen to me? Or I could say, why did that happen to me? And the moment I got that curiosity, everything happened for a reason, and that reason is there to serve me. I went into curiosity mode and said, why did this happen? And all of a sudden, a principle came to my mind that I would teach my students. It's a universal principle that says, that which is not utilized is eliminated. See, my gift is to teach. One inch further, the dog would have got my jugular and me and my gift would have been gone. And in that moment, I realized I had to start training again. I didn't have to because financially I hadn't had to do anything for years, but I had to because it's my purpose, it's my passion, it's my gift. I believe everybody on this planet has a gift to give this world. If they didn't, they would not be breathing anymore. And so I realized how quickly my gift could have been gone. And in that moment, I made the decision that I had to come out of retirement. And because of my back surgeries, it still took a year and a half to fully come out of retirement. But I'll tell you this, I will train for the rest of my life. There, I will never, I don't care how long I'm doing, I will never quit teaching. If that wasn't a message that was uh, being sent to you, I don't know what other way it could have, you know, manifested itself because the, the fact that, you know, you're going back to your house and the first thought that came to your mind was, if I get blood in the house, my wife's going to kill me just reminds me that no matter how you know famous you are, popular, popular, popular you are or anything else like that, uh, if you're married, you become very you, be, you become humbled very quick when you have a spouse. Yes. Uh, especially Absolutely. when it comes to uh, you know your own home and your own domicile and, and everything like that. So 
And I also find it pretty amazing that, you know, the first thought you had in your head too, when you were walking back or, you know, when you had the dog hanging from your face was like, Hey, there's kids back there that can see this. And, and you, you know, you're thinking to yourself how that could impact them. And you're telling them, Hey, get out of here. You know, I mean, you weren't even thinking about self-preservation. Uh, it sounds like at any of that, any of this point, you know, and besides when you put your head down, so the dog didn't get your neck, uh, which thankfully you did that. Right. Um, uh, yeah. that, that's also a testament, you know, to, to your mentality about thinking about others and, and being able to share your gift with others. So, you know, the fact that your mind quickly went to that is also like another self-realization of where your mind really is and what, what your passion really is. Right. So I think that's, uh, that's pretty amazing for sure. I, I agree. And I'd never thought of it like that. And like right now I'm lit up, I've got goosebumps. I, I had never thought of it that way, but I heard it on awesome. one of your episodes I was listening to. And it's something that I think you find in common with a lot of your guests is that there's the call it servant leadership. The, the people that yeah. truly are here to help others and, and be of service that, you know, because when you help others, your life is going to be phenomenal. It may not be easy, but I guarantee it'll be phenomenal. And that's, that's the way I look, I look at life. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I love that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's servant leadership. It's, when you when you're living a life to to help others, I mean, you get so much more out of that. You know, you can sit here like like you said, uh, people that make more money, right? It, it it defines more of who you are. Like the the truer you comes out when you have more money, right? Whether yes, whether you know if you're a jerk, you just become more jerky, and if you're a, a good person that that's trying to help others, you will continue to help others in more ways than you were able to before because now you have the the uh, the money to do so. Absolutely, so I, I think that's. Um, absolutely amazing because money doesn't change who you are. Like you said, it just, it just reiterates who you are. Yeah. And, and when people understand that money is nothing more than a tool, Yes, but yet we get so emotionally attached to it and money is important where money is important, but it's not important where it's not important. And so it's just a simple tool. And if you understand that uh, you look at that, then it's like going into your garage to your toolbox and saying, what tool do I need right now? Right. And then grabbing that tool. And, and so if you're like, well, I could use more money. Well, then how do I enhance that tool to yep. be able to have more of it? Absolutely. So I, I think the biggest thing is like, especially for my listeners here is that you, you can hear it in this conversation, just like many of the other interviews that I've had on here. The biggest thing that you should focus on when it comes to building yourself up financially is your mentality and how you go about doing it. And one of the things that, you know, or some of the things that we touched about, you know, was it's not just your financial health, it's your mental health, your physical health, like all of this ties into it. You, you can't just be focused on one thing. Otherwise, not only are you uh, inviting that chaos in, but you're inviting it in, you know, without any regulation. So there's no pro there's no problem with inviting chaos in, like you alluded to earlier, right? It's how you handle that chaos and what it okay. does to you, how it changes you. Um, cause I could tell you, you know, being in the military for, uh, going on 19 years this July that I I've lived in chaos, uh, on a day in day out basis on, on a lot of times, especially on deployment, it's having the mental strength and, and mental fortitude to, to be able to overcome the chaos and learn from it. Right. The chaos is there to teach you a lesson, um, yeah. which, which is huge, which is huge. And if I could give you a visual, cause one of the things I want people to understand when they, they talk about the four phases is that. Once you go through the unclutter phase, it takes you right back into the observation phase. So they're constantly revolving around. And I want people to picture in their mind a straight line, a straight line that's going horizontally. And picture a wave that starts with at where the line and the wave interact. That's one. At the peak of that is a two. As you start going down, you see three, four, five. The bottom is six. And coming back up is seven right before it hits the straight line again. And picture that wave. And at any point in your time in your life, you can sit there and choose an area of your life and say, if I'm looking at this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, where would I say I am at that moment? And so as an example, if you look at it and you go, well, things are just amazing right now. I'm feeling awesome. I feel like I'm at the two. I'm at the peak, right at the top. Well, if you're feeling that you're at a two, you are in the pamper phase. So this is the time to enjoy, to reap the benefits, to enjoy what you've created, because one and seven, that's observation phase. You're on the climb, right? Two is the pamper phase. That's the time to take care of you. The three, four, five, that's the energy phase. 
That's the time to be, you're building up momentum as you're um, going down in energy, picking up the momentum. Six is the unclutter phase. And so you can actually check in with yourself on any area of your life because your relationship might, might be at a three, but maybe your finances are at a six at the moment. And so different parts of your life can be in different parts of the phase. And when you have an understanding, then it allows you to embrace some better and ask yourself, okay, yeah, wow, well, no wonder I, I'm in the unclutter phase in this part of my life. Great. What can you courageously destroy in that part of your life then to allow you then go back into the observation phase? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so just so you know, I just drew a picture of a wave and, and wrote all those numbers down. And it makes it makes perfect sense when you look at it like physically in front of you. So maybe in the show notes, I'll have a picture of that on there so people could see that, get a visual. But um, you know, it's, it's uh -huh. funny. Um, I, I'm going to make my kids listen to this, especially the part about the unclutter phase, because we, we're kind of, uh, you know, doing this right now, uh, literally and figuratively with, with their bedrooms, uh, they're in unclutter phase and they have invited chaos into their room, uh, via their mother because they have not done what they were supposed to do with, uh, you know, choosing things to get rid of. So now, uh, you know, their mother is making that choice for them. So they've invited that chaos yeah. into their life. So this, you know, it's, it's funny because I'm tying this back into my personal life and just watching what's going on in that situation. I could tie it into what's going on with my kids. Right. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to have them listen to this particular section. So they understand like how it got to this point, uh, you know, because this, yeah, this, I, I really like, I, I really but, like the point. Mr. Officer I, Navy dad, <laughs> Officer Navy dad, the key is going to be no attachment to it. Right. Because now, right. if you're bringing kids, this is the way it should be, you're putting your perspective on them. But if you allow them to listen to it with no attachment of what they get or do not get out of it, you mm -hmm. may just see more miracles happen than you could um, kind of realize. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Um, Robert, yeah. So this this has been an absolutely amazing conversation. I, You know, I've, I've really gotten more out of this than I think I have from uh, – many other interviews, uh, just what I've personally attached to myself uh, with talking with you. And I, and I truly, truly appreciate it. I, I mean, you know, when we talk about the four currencies of life, the four phases of life that people go through, I mean, all this stuff is critical things that if you, you know, if it's not something that you know about, you're not really thinking about it, but it's always happening, you know, in, in the background and you just don't realize it. You don't know what you don't know. Right. And um, exactly. And I'm glad that I know it now. So it's it's funny because I can tie all this into, you know, what I'm doing, you know, myself, both, you know, in the Navy as an entrepreneur and, and you know, what I plan to do when I retire from the Navy. Uh, and this is this is one of those things that can be a, a lifetime lesson for for those that are listening, for sure. Yeah, and I totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was going to ask you, like, so, you know, with everything that we've talked about, you know, this this is all super amazing. Is there like any last tips or tricks that you would recommend for somebody that that is just getting started out and they're looking to get to that point of financial independence or they're looking to start their own business and become an entrepreneur? What is it that you would recommend for the the person that's starting out right now? Let's say they're starting out with $150,000 in debt and they don't know what to do. What would you recommend to them? Wanting to become an entrepreneur, get Michael Gerber's book. E-Myth, because I wish I would have had that as a Domino's Pizza franchisee. I got to tell you, I'm rereading it right now as we speak, and I'm going, I'm getting the one-handed claps more and more because I had read it years ago and now rereading it, I'm in a different space. I'm getting it on a deeper level. So I, I would definitely read that book. But two is one of the reasons most people get overwhelmed. And overwhelm is probably one of the biggest um, obstacles in people's lives. And what I've discovered in, in just my observation traveling around the world and being with a lot of people is there's you and then you, there's your goal, your dream, where you think you should be. And the reason people get overwhelmed is because instead of being present in the moment where they are, they're a thousand feet ahead of themselves trying to figure out every step of how do I get to where I need to go. And so what I encourage people to do is take a deep breath and come back to the present and take one step. See, this is why I love vision board. My vision board is things I want to see in the next three to five years. However, and this is why, like in my book, Success Left a Clue, I teach people to dream big, but then I give them the practical steps of how to achieve it, is once you put your vision out there three to five years out, walk yourself back to where, what can I do today in the present to take one step towards that? I don't have to know everything. I don't have to know every detail, 
but what could I do today that is an action that moves me towards that? And then once you take that step, check in with yourself. How am I doing? I'm doing good. Okay, what's one more step? And if you take that success one step at a time, you're going to find you have less stress. I'm never going to tell people that success is easy, Mike, because it's not. You have to put the work in. However, it is simple. It's simple if you follow, find a system that's working, follow the system. You can have the success, but do it one step at a time instead of trying to be a thousand. You know, there's a saying I love that says the um, journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And so when you take that first step. Funny, I I literally just put that quote in my Facebook group like two or three weeks ago. I, I had, I had my graphics designer make me like a little quote, average Joe finances quote board. Uh, with that exact thing on there, uh, Lu Zhao, right? I think is who said yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Awesome. And so come back to the first one step. And then the final thing is I believe that the greatest gift, the greatest gift that anybody can give this world is to be themselves. Be you. Because some people are going to like you, some people aren't. And whoever likes you for who you are, great. Whoever doesn't, <laughs> there's 8 billion people on this planet. You're never going to get them all to like you. But I'm a, I'm a people pleaser. I came from being a huge people pleaser and I tried to please everybody and man, was that tiring. But now when I show up as me, I'm always blown away with who shows up in my life that likes me for who I am, not who they think I should be. And so be you. That's the greatest gift you can give the world. Absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent agree with that. Be yourself. Don't try to be anyone else. You know, we are our own individuals and that's important to recognize you know, who you yeah. are because you're important and you matter no matter what. Awesome. Amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, so, you know, based on this interview um, and, and with all the, the fantastic information that we talked about, I know there's so much more, right? So for those that want to know a little bit more about you or want to know a little bit more about what you're doing or want to know more about the things that we talked about, do you have a website and like social media and stuff that you can share with, uh, with our listeners? Yeah, my main website is the title of my book, uh, my first book, because I'm working on my second one now, but it's successleftaclue.com. And um, Facebook is probably the, I've got, now that I've got virtual assistants, we're working on um, getting my social media out, up and to date more, but I've got my Facebook fan page. So just Robert Riopel, um, you'll find the Robert Riopel fan page on Facebook. Follow me. I'm always doing stuff on there. Um, and then what I'd love to do for your listeners, my gift is, for anybody who's interested, if they go to SLAC, which is success left a clue, so S-L-A-C dot rocks, R-O-C-K-S, forward slash book, they can get a copy, the ebook version of my um, book, Success Left a Clue, as a gift to them for being your listeners. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm going to make sure I have all these links in the show notes. Uh, so for those of you listening, don't miss out on that chance to get the, get the ebook, get a PDF copy. Uh, because I can tell you just in this short interaction, the short interview that I've had with Robert, uh, between what we recorded here that you're listening to right now, plus what we talked about before I even hit the record button, that he is le- legitimately doing some amazing things and changing people's lives, uh, you know, and helping people realize their own potential. And, and you know, that's one of the the beautiful things about successful coaches like him is what they do, the impact that they make. So, uh, again, Robert. Uh, I am truly humbled and I'm so appreciative that you took some time to talk with me today. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Aloha. 